Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Today we're tackling something really positive, actually. People living with HIV are, well, they're aging successfully, living longer, thriving. It's a huge medical win. Absolutely. A real success story. But, you know, success brings its own challenges. So today we're cutting through the noise to give you a really critical update on how care is adapting. Specifically, we're zeroing in on a massive shift in uh, comprehensive lab testing. A necessary shift, I'd say. Definitely. We're diving into the new European AIDS Clinical Society EACS guidelines. These just came out at the conference in Paris. Now, if you're in the U.S. living with HIV or working in care, you might think, European guidelines, why me? Right, that's a fair question. Well, our mission here is simple. These guidelines, they show where the global standard is heading fast. Think of this as your shortcut to understanding the, uh, the testing changes you need to be asking your provider about right now if you want truly proactive care. And let's get straight to the core takeaway. HIV care isn't just about viral suppression anymore. I mean, that's still fundamental, obviously. Right. But the emphasis now, it's squarely on, let's call it systemic health surveillance. We're really focused on managing the whole person's health, not just the virus. It's a move to, well, holistic care. Okay, let's unpack that, this philosophical shift from just viral load to systemic surveillance. Mm. What does that actually mean for the specific lab tests, the ones you should be asking for? Maybe start with the aging population aspect. Exactly. So the EACS guidelines really acknowledge that as people with HIV live longer, these other health issues, comorbidities, become much more common hmm. and critical. Like heart disease, cancer. Precisely. Cardiovascular stuff, cancer risk, chronic kidney and liver disease, metabolic syndrome, and importantly, mental health issues too. So that forces a change in the labs. And it forces the scope to expand dramatically. We can't just look at viral load and CD4 count and call it a day. It's just not the full picture anymore. We have to routinely include cardiovascular risk labs, metabolic panels, cancer screening follow-ups. It's broader. I noticed reading through them, the clinical targets seem much tighter now. That must affect how often we monitor labs. Can you give an example? Like maybe with blood pressure. Yeah, the targets are definitely tighter because the goal is prevention, catching things early. Take blood pressure. The recommended control target is now down to 129 millimeter Hg. That's quite um, aggressive. It shows a real push to prevent hypertension sooner rather than later. Wow, 129. And same with lipids. They're recommending starting statins earlier based on risk calculators which means, you know, labs that might have been optional before, they're now pretty much standard routine care. So more frequent checks of? More frequent checks of lipids, the whole panel. Mm -hmm. Comprehensive liver and kidney function tests, mm. specific glucose and HbA1c levels. It's all about proactive risk reduction. And what's really interesting is this huge expansion in monitoring happens even while the actual HIV treatment, the IRT, is kind of on cruise control for many people. That's a good way to put it, yeah. First-line RT, usually with these second-gen integrase inhibitors, works so well. Mm. Once you hit undetectable, regimen changes aren't that frequent for lots of folks. Right. But what's fascinating, like you said, is while checking the viral load stays absolutely key, the focus shifts. Right. We need to make sure that stability isn't hiding or um, contributing to long-term systemic issues. We need labs to check for drug, uh, drug interactions, DVIs, with other meds someone might be taking. Ah, good point. And to watch for those specific long-term risks, kidney health, bone density, and also weight changes or metabolic effects hmm. tied to the specific RT drug someone's on. Okay, so stability with RT means we focus more on long-term risks, but what about the beginning? Before someone's even on treatment or maybe starting prevention, let's talk PEP and this uh, HIV RNA testing update. Sounds critical. It really is, perhaps the single most crucial update for prevention. The EACS guidelines now specifically say perform HIV RNA testing, that's a viral load test, before starting long-acting injectable PP. Yes. Or if someone reports a recent high-risk exposure, even if their standard HIV test is negative. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting, especially for our U.S. listeners. Why is RNA testing so vital here? What does it catch that the standard antigen antibody test might miss? It really boils down to timing. Your standard test looks for the body's response to the virus antibodies or antigens. It can miss very early infection, what we call acute HIV, simply because the body hasn't had time to mount that detectable response yet. Makes sense. RNA testing, though, detects the actual virus, its genetic material. It finds it much, much sooner. And starting pre-EP, if someone actually has acute HIV, 
That's bad news. It has potentially devastating implications. You could develop drug resistance because pre-EP isn't a full treatment regimen. It's just not strong enough. Okay, let's walk through that scenario you mentioned, scenario A. Someone had a high-risk exposure, say, 10 days ago. They come in for pre-EP. Standard test today might be negative? Correct. And that's standard negative test. According to EACS, if you suspect acute infection because of that recent exposure, it's just not enough anymore. So what's the next step? The crucial step is asking specifically for the HIV RNA test right then. If that test is positive, forget PAP. That person has an acute infection and needs to pivot immediately to a full, effective RT regimen. Right. Now, practically speaking, for someone listening in the U.S. asking for RNA testing in this scenario, maybe before U.S. guidelines fully catch up, could there be pushback? There might be some friction, yes. Insurance hurdles, maybe provider familiarity. But this guideline shift is a wake-up call. If you've had a high-risk exposure recently, you need to be your own advocate. Ask your provider specifically about adding HIV RNA testing. It might take an extra conversation, maybe some justification, but it's critical. That's a really clear, actionable takeaway. We'll definitely loop back to that in a checklist format later. Okay, so moving beyond just viral status, these EACS updates really cover a broad scope of proactive health, don't they? Let's touch on vaccinations and cancer screening. They really do. It's comprehensive. Yeah, there's a strong emphasis on vaccines, like the new RSV one for folks 75 and up, updated Hep B protocols, and then all this cancer screening. Specific cancers mentioned are liver cancer, HCC, prostate, anal, breast, cervical, lung. It feels like it's way beyond just a physical exam now. It's tied to lab work. Absolutely tied to lab work. Mm -hmm. For hepatitis B, for example, we need the full serology panel. That means checking HBS AG, anti-HBs, anti-HBC. These tell you if the virus is active, if you're immune from a vaccine, or if you've been exposed before. Okay. And sometimes we even need to check the HBV DNA, the viral load for hep B. Plus, Consistently checking liver enzymes is crucial for monitoring that HCC risk, especially in certain groups. That level of detail is pretty intense, and I know the guidelines also talk about being extra careful when switching RT regimens. What labs become mandatory then? Yes, Scenario C highlights a really key situation. Mm. If you're switching to an RT regimen that doesn't include tenofovir, and tenofovir is known to suppress hepatitis B. Right, it works on both. Exactly. So if you have a history of HBV co-infection and you stop tenofovir, yeah. the guidelines say more frequent monitoring of your HBV DNA and your liver enzymes is mandatory absolutely required. Why mandatory? To catch potential HPV reactivation. Removing that tenofovir can let the hepatitis B rebound, sometimes causing severe liver inflammation or flare. It's a major safety check. Wow. Okay, so wait, my doctor isn't just asking about viral load, kidneys, liver, but now maybe using screening tools for mental health, like suicide risk, yeah. or substance use, alcohol, even sleep quality. It feels like the HIV checkup is becoming more like a full preventative wellness exam. How does asking about my sleep possibly affect my lab work? It's all connected. These yeah. things, mental health, substance use, even poor sleep link directly to metabolic and inflammatory risks. Ah. So if someone reports chronic poor sleep or maybe issues with alcohol, we pay closer attention to liver panels like Astalt, maybe GGT, which can sometimes flag issues related to alcohol. Yeah. If there's chronic stress or significant weight changes, we're definitely watching the lipid panel closely and especially HbA1c for long-term glucose control. These objective details. They flag the need for specific labs to catch things like metabolic syndrome early before it really takes hold. This has been incredibly specific, but the underlying theme is clear. We need to ask for a wider range of labs. So let's try and synthesize this, make it actionable for listeners, maybe frame it as uh, labs I should ask my provider about checklist. Good idea. Let's break it down. Okay, first up, baseline or diagnosis checklist if you're newly diagnosed or just starting care obviously the foundational tests, but crucially, adding that HIV RNA if you suspect recent exposure, and naturally your baseline CD4 count. What about the comorbidity markers right at the start? Definitely need those comprehensive metabolic checks early on. So, full liver and kidney function tests, yeah. a complete lipid panel for cholesterol, mm -hmm. an HbA1c to get a baseline for glucose control, critically important. Get the full hepatitis B and C serologies done so you know your status right away. And cancer and vaccine status. Yes, make sure your provider checks your cancer screening history and your vaccination status, especially for things like RSV now and ensuring your hepatitis B protection is up to date, mm -hmm. maybe needing boosters. Okay, that's baseline. What about ongoing monitoring? How often? Well, the frequency depends on stability. For HIV, RNA, and CD4, it's usually every three to six months until you're stable and undetectable. 
then you might stretch it to every six or even 12 months. Right. But those crucial systemic checks, kidney, liver, lipids, glucose, those should be done at least annually, minimum, and much more often if any results are abnormal or borderline. And then there's the specialized monitoring we talked about. Exactly. Like if you have chronic hepatitis B screening for liver cancer, that HCC ultrasound should probably happen every 6 to 12 months depending on your risk factors. So the lab frequency isn't just about the virus anymore. It's about your whole health picture, your overall risk profile. So the really crucial question for listeners in the U.S. to ask their provider seems pretty straightforward then. Are we ordering the full set of labs that cover comorbidities, cardiovascular, metabolic, cancer risk like these new global guidelines suggest? Or are we still mainly focused on just viral load and CD4? That's precisely the conversation to have. These EACS updates really drive home this proactive, broader approach. Think about scenario B. Someone stable, undetectable for two years. Great. HIV monitoring might decrease, Okay. but if their comorbidities start to creep up, say lipids get high or they gain significant weight, then the overall lab frequency actually needs to increase substantially to manage those new risks. Yeah. Knowing your viral load trend is still vital, absolutely, but it's just one piece of a much bigger puzzle now. This deep dive really hammers home that we're in a new era. We need to maybe even demand this proactive, holistic health surveillance. We absolutely are. The ECS updates confirm it. Proactive labs covering kidney, liver, metabolic health, vaccine status, cancer screening. It's all essential now for long-term health, for quality of life. Even when the viral load is perfectly suppressed, we're managing decades of health now, not just years. So if you're thinking about pre-P, or maybe switching your RQ regimen soon, use this deep dive. Make sure your provider includes HIV RNA testing if there's any chance of acute infection. And really important, ensure they're monitoring HBV DNA and liver enzymes frequently if you're moving off tenofovir and have a history of hep B. Definitely. And maybe a funny thought for you to mull over. Since EACS is pushing for tighter blood pressure control down at 129 and really emphasizing metabolic health, Think about what other, maybe seemingly subjective things, like a sudden significant weight change or persistent fatigue you can't explain or even just ongoing poor sleep, you should be bringing up with your provider. Don't dismiss them, those details. They could directly impact which specialized labs are needed next to truly make sure your long-term systemic health is being prioritized. 